Hey guys, so in this video I'm going to do something a bit unusual. I'm going to focus mainly talking about my development cycle or how I develop iOS apps and more specifically kind of debriefing my thoughts and learnings of the most recent app I built called Pensato. So check out my previous video and I'll leave a link in the description if you want to download the app. But in this one I'm just going to go over my, it's going to be more of like a technical geeky video. So if you're just here for the synths you can probably skip this video. But if you're interested in just my general general philosophy of developing apps and kind of what I've learned building Pensato. Um, I'm just going to kind of brain dump all that in this video. So we're going to do it in multiple different sections. The idea was a bit vague. I knew I wanted to do something to help me think about scale and key modulation. And as I started researching different tools and seeing what's available out there, I noticed there's you can kind of get the information, but it's all scattered and it's not usually very well presented. So I wanted to create something that is very focused and specific for this uh, use case. And that's where the idea of this app came from. So my general process of building an app, I guess it starts with an idea, uh, which I guess is pretty obvious, or some kind of problem that I want to solve for myself. But sometimes it's also just experimenting with random things I'm interested in and then ideas come from the experimentation. So this one was a bit of a combination of that. I started off building kind of like a music theory toolkit in Swift and I started in that without knowing exactly what the interface was going to look like. So I primarily knew the types of tool sets I would need. For example, I would need a way to transpose chords or figure out the chord name given a set of notes and then find a set of scales given a set of chords, find a set of chords given a set of scales. So I basically built up this little library of functions that I would need and um, took a bit of a TDD approach, which is like uh, test driven development, where you effectively write your tests first, essentially, I didn't do it that religiously, but effectively for everything I wrote, I used the test to validate because I had no interface. And that proved to be beneficial at the end because I had huge test coverage uh, once I was done with that library. Um, there were a bit of cons with that too, which I'll talk about at the end. So before I write any code, I'm usually sketching out on paper. So let me see if I can find, there's a good giant mess of scribbles here. I'm probably going to throw this out. because. But yeah, this is the kind of stuff, I don't know if you can see that on the camera there, but I basically just do kind of high level, super loose sketches of what the interface might look like. And sometimes I just kind of sit back, close my eyes and picture like, what would I want to do as a user um, to get this information? What, what is like the intuitive um, workflow there? And this is a lot of back and forth and a lot of kind of mental struggles and battles. <laughs> The, the app at the end often looks nothing like what I initially thought it would be. So a lot of it is kind of getting a small hint of an idea, starting to work on it. And then as you're working on it, you start discovering and getting kind of aha moments that lead you down different paths. All right, next, let me talk about music theory and how to represent it in a programming uh, environment or mathematical sense. There's a really interesting marriage. I would encourage anyone who likes programming and music to attempt to build these kinds of theory systems because there's a lot of interesting algorithms, uh, interesting data structures that you have to think about, but also it's a good marriage between things that are describable purely programmatically or mathematically, but also combination of things that are very human. So like exceptions that you have to hard code that you can just routine into your code here. So one of the primary challenges uh, for this app in particular is representing scales in a programming context. So chords and notes are pretty straightforward because they all you can all represent them mathematically and there's a very strict procedure you can apply for example, chords have a very simple system, like the if a chord is minor, there's a little M there. If it's augmented, you put a little plus or a sharp five. If it's a seven, there's a seven. If it's diminished, there's a little circle or a dim. So you can effectively, given a set of notes, you can find the intervals of each note. And given the intervals, you can deduce the name of the chord and vice versa. Given a chord name, you can always reverse back into figuring out what notes are in that chord. So in that sense, chords are fairly straightforward in terms of naming them in programming context. But scales are a whole different beast uh, because scale names are effectively human made and they're 
nonsensical in the sense that they're not, there's no intuition. Like the word major has nothing to do, it doesn't describe the notes that are in there. Uh, it, it does in the sense that we've memorized it, but in terms of a computer, like if it sees the word M, A, J, O, R, there's no way for it to say, oh, okay, this is these notes. You have to hard code that in a sense. And so the most intuitive way to do that is to represent a set of pitch intervals. So for major, you have uh, tone, tone, semitone, tone, 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 semitone. So you can represent that um, if you think of each semitone as a value of plus one and a tone is plus two, you would effectively encode an array of like two, two, one, two, 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 one for major. And what's cool about that system is that it's independent of the root note. So regardless of what root note you start with, you can always apply that set of intervals and get a major scale. So in a sense, to describe a library of scales, you're just describing a series of these intervals. So that's how I started initially representing it, and that was the most intuitive way for me to do it. And that's the way I did it in my Note Kitchen uh, web app. So if you're not familiar, I'll put a link in the description. It's a little tool for kind of just searching scales and chords as well. Um, so that's the system I had there, and I, had, I started off with a fairly limited set of scales. But then I was doing more research, and I was trying to find how to categorize scales and this was a bit of a frustrating process because a lot of the information you find is very contained to simple things like major, minor, diminished. So most of the searches you find and most of the top hits are very kind of simple. So you're not going to find like four note scales or you're not going to find weird like non-popular scales. So for a huge part of my development of Pensato, I had this model in mind of just having a list of scale intervals that you can then apply to different root notes if you wanted to. And to get the name, I would basically just hard code the name for each set of intervals. So for the 221, 2221, it would be major and then et cetera, et cetera. That was my initial way of thinking. So then as I started doing more research online to see what else was out there, I started reading a bunch of papers and then I came across this guy called Ian Ring. I'll put a link to his website. You should definitely check him out because it was a huge inspiration for me and kind of mind, uh, like it opened my mind to new possibilities in terms of scale representations. He came up with this system, which is super cool, which I ended up adopting in my app as well, where effectively he, he takes the um, 12 notes within an octave and maps each note to a bit. So then you have a 12 bit word because you have 12 notes where one represents the note is on and zero represents the note is off. So if you re represent it that way, Essentially, you're mapping any every possible combination of scale imaginable within a single number. What's cool there is then you can effectively represent scales by simple integers. And the integer isn't just a pointer into an index. It's not an index or pointer to a scale. It's the actual data of the scale itself. So just having that integer tells you exactly what the scale is because you can look at the bits in the number and pinpoint and turn on whichever notes you want. And what's cool about the system is very lightweight. All you have to do is use a number to represent a scale effectively. So I ended up, when I kind of discovered this, I refactored my app to adopt this system because I find it much more elegant and it allows you to represent basically all the different scales. But then the challenge still remains of how you name the scales, right? Because the number, again, doesn't represent the, the fact that it's major. So what I ended up building there is effectively a giant hash map of the key being the, the integer that represents the scale, which ended up calling a scale vector just arbitrarily. And then for each scale vector, you have a, an array of different names. And that's the other challenge of scales as well, is that not only do you have one name per scale, some scales have synonyms and different kinds of names. So then there's a whole other challenge of like when you use the right name, which name do you use, which one is more popular. So he has a whole database for every integer. So you see here 661 represents the major pentatonic scale. And then you can see has, there's a whole list of uh, synonyms out there. And he has way more information. So if you really want to nerd out, and I, I can't go into all the details here, definitely check out his website if you really want to nerd out on an analysis of scales, how they relate to each other and all that. This is a great resource. So the other website I found while I was researching this through Ian Ring is this allthescales.org by this uh, William Zaitler. So I reached out to him and he, he agreed to let me use some of the names he had for his scales. And I put both of their links as credits in my app as well. So if you wanna get the links from the app, uh, you can just go to the settings credits and then you'll see those two there. What, what uh, he did, William, is he effectively came up with a system to name scales because if you think about it, if you're doing a permutation of every imaginable scale, 
combina combination of notes that results in a scale, the vast majority of those scales haven't been named or studied and aren't popular. Like the, the popular scales that we all know and love are a very small subset of the theoretical possibilities of combinations of notes you can play uh, to create a scale. So he devised the system for naming scales depending on the number of tones you have. So you get these really kind of elvish <laughs> sounding names, uh, as you can see here. I don't even know how to pronounce these. Gajidic, Solidic, Zilidic. <laughs> they sound kind of weird, but the, like his philosophy is interesting is that like in theory we don't need names like for some reason as humans we 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 love to name things like everything needs to have a name otherwise it doesn't exist so we feel we have this comfort when we name stuff so in a sense he named them for that reason but there's no reason you can't play a scale called 372 um, it's just for some reason we love naming things so he solved that problem so the vast majority of, of the names he came up with, I use in my app as well. So if you're, if you enable that like exotic filter mode and you start plugging in just completely random things. So if you see a very cryptic name, it's thanks to uh, William here. So check out his site as well. Um, super shout out to both these guys for putting in so much work for kind of categorizing scales, which you don't really find in a lot of other websites. Most websites out there focus on minor major stuff. So yeah, representing music theory concepts in code is a very interesting thing and you get a lot of interesting algorithms like transposing scales because you always have to modulo 12. You don't, because you when you transpose a note outside of its octave, it becomes like a reflection back to itself. And there's other interesting algorithms like figuring out when to use flats or sharps in scale notes. And this is something I discovered recently. I probably should have known this a long time ago. But effectively, when you're naming a scale, if you're wondering why sometimes you see sharps, sometimes you see flats, most of the time you're trying to, at least in a diatonic scale uh, family, you want to have each letter in a scale appear only once. So for example, you want C, D, E, F, G, A, B. If you have to flatten or sharpen one of the notes such that you get a duplicate. So for example, if you have G and then G flat, then you, the G, the letter G appears twice. So that's the point where you know you can't use flat, so you would prefer to use sharps. So thinking about having um, an algorithm to predict that or figure out what to use depending on that is a pretty interesting problem to solve. So th that's kind of a side note. But yeah, there's a lot of interesting uh, like data structures and algorithms you can extract from trying to represent music theory in a um, computer, I guess. So first let's talk about minimalism. So I think we're all familiar with minimalism in the sense of decluttering your house and just having less physical objects. But the same concept can apply to app development as well. So people, different people have different opinions on this stuff. For me personally, I prefer minimal apps or apps that do one thing really well. So I used to be in the camp that I thought that you needed a lot of feature to make something valuable. And recently I kind of changed my mind on that because as you start building your own apps, if you're trying to make things as minimal as possible, you realize how hard it is to remove things. And so I've kind of changed my thinking because the value in a minimal app isn't so much in the list of features, but it's in the time saving that the developer has done for you. So the developer or designer of the app has spent time considering all the different possibilities and removing things for you and giving you only what you need. So the amount of work that they've done to do that may not be apparent because you're getting something very, that looks deceptively simple, but there's a lot of work that goes into making something appear simple. Um, so in, in my mind now, I've changed my philosophy. So I find minimal apps to be more valuable than apps with more features because they save me time. Um, so anyways, that, that was my little thought on minimalism. And that's something I try to strive for in my apps in general. So one way I like to think about this is to take an additive approach to designing an app rather than subtractive. And this, I guess, has parallels to synthesis as well. Uh, but the general idea is that instead of starting with a giant pool of features, putting them in the app and then figuring out what to remove, start with nothing. So this is kind of a checklist. Start with, let's say you have no app. Then you ask yourself, assuming you have a problem to solve, which you probably should if you're building an app, um, Start with nothing and then ask yourself, is the problem solved? If the answer is yes, then you don't even need to build an app, you're good to go. <laughs> if the answer is no, then maybe ask yourself, is the app the right way to solve this problem? Or can I solve this with a piece of paper? And then you kind of just keep going. I know it's a kind of an extreme far-fetched example, but it's good to have a, as a mental process. 
So this applies to when you start building the app as well. So for example, you would start the app with nothing, just a blank screen. And then you ask yourself, okay, is the problem solved here? If the answer is yes, then you're done, which is probably rare with a blank screen, but most likely the answer will be no. And then you ask yourself, okay, what is the most minimal thing I can do to solve the problem now? If it's just adding a button, then you're good to go. That's probably the minimal you can do. Uh, if the answer is no, then you kind of keep going like that. Obviously, you're not going to do this in practice and like put the button, launch the app and test it. It's more of a mental exercise to force you to be very restrictive about what you add because the potential cost of adding something can be exponential. You might think that, oh, I'm just going to add this one feature here. What can go wrong? It's like famous last words, right? Um, you realize that you increase the probability of bugs, you increase the confusion in the user, you increase the amount of code you need to maintain. So everything kind of trickles down. So the less code, the less features, the less clutter, the kind of the cleaner the app is, the, the calmer the user is, and I feel like everybody wins. So all that being said, I'm not pretending to, I'm not trying to preach or like from a high horse or something. I, I definitely know that my apps aren't nowhere as minimal as I would like them to be. So I'm definitely still trying to struggle in this, but it's the kind of advice I like to keep at a high level that I wish I could keep reminding myself as I'm working, because it's easy to forget this stuff when you're kind of grinding day to day. All right, next let's talk about visual design and aesthetics. So again, I like to keep a minimal design here because I'm not a designer uh, by trade. I like to think that I have an eye for visual stuff, uh, but obviously there are designers that are way better than me. So where I lack in just pure design skills, I try to make up for in having very rigid kind of design systems. So this is something I picked up at my last company that I worked at. And we built this very elaborate design system in-house to help us move faster. And a, a design system is effectively a set of tools and kind of Lego blocks of components and parameters and systems around design so that every time you add a new screen, you're not having to think of pixels and colors. You can just pull from the library and kind of put Legos together essentially for lack of better metaphor. Um, so I've adopted this general philosophy in my apps as well, which helps me move much faster and allows me to think about visual design a bit less where what I mean by that is I'm thinking more in terms of the, the information layout and the experience of the user rather than the specific pixels or colors. So more concretely, what this means is that you would have a set of colors in a library, for example. Uh, so instead of having hex values or RGB values sprinkled throughout your code, you would have high level concepts like primary title color, secondary title or something like that. And then same thing for spacing, which I showed you briefly with the SnapKit example, where you would have space contain uh, constraints like small, medium, large, and you would have a very specific set of fonts that you can choose from. So once you've parameterized all your stuff, you've kind of removed, you've abstracted away the actual details of the design elements like pixels, colors, and fonts and you've created a facade of high level concepts that you can play with. And the key here is to have a very minimal, again, the minimalism comes into play. You want to have a very minimal set of these choices because the more choices you have, the more, I guess, of a design pro you need to be to know what works when. So to compensate for my lack of design skills, I try to have as little choices as possible. So I only have three different sizes. I only use one font, maybe a couple of font sizes and a handful of colors. And then when I'm building the app, I just use these parameters. And the other advantage there is that you have then a central place to start tweaking the value. So you can globally change all the spacing, globally change all your primary colors in one snapshot. So that's one thing I would recommend if you're a solo developer like me, and maybe you're not design inclined, is to try to come up with a simple system and use that system throughout your app. So because consistency far outweighs like perfection in any one good design point, uh, in my opinion. So like it's better to have the same font everywhere and maybe two different fonts, like the same font size for all your titles, the same spacing for all, between all your cells. It's much better to be consistent than to have one, like than to find the actual perfect value you need to use. Anyways, that was a long ramble on my design philosophy, but this also helps me save time. So it's got a practical aspect as well, um, especially as solo developers who like don't get paid. So <laughs> it's good to save time and money whenever you can. And in terms of the actual process of designing the app, I am a bit unorthodox. Again, going back to my, I'm not a designer. So I don't actually create visual designs in a design software like Sketch or Photoshop or anything like that. 
I essentially go straight from paper to code, <laughs> which is a bit blasphemous to some circles, but I, I like to, again, it goes back to that system, which is another advantage. I tend to sketch just general outlines. Okay, I want a button here. I want roughly a list of things here. And then I like to play around in design and code, essentially. So the combination of using SnapKit for my layout, as well as using this rigid design system, allows me to really quickly prototype, effectively on the, on the spot, uh, visual layouts. So for example, if I wanted to draw a square or cell or a button or something, I would just, add my constraints and uh, colors and all the presets I've defined and just kind of boot it up and see what it looks like. The advantage there again is saving time, but also you're kind of, you, you can think of once you've set up this visual design library or system in your code, you're essentially removing the need to have to redesign everything from scratch in like a visual design tool because you're you're building a design rendering. Like the iPhone is rendering designs for you if you think about it. So instead of using like a paintbrush in Photoshop, you're using SnapKit here. So it might be a little far-fetched <laughs> example. So nothing against the actual doing design. So if you have a designer or you're working at a company or you have the resources and the funds and all that, or if you're a designer yourself, there's nothing against making something beautiful in like Photoshop or something and then trying to replicate it. But essentially you're doing twice to work in some cases if you're if you're also a developer. Uh, that being said, my apps are definitely not gonna win any like design prizes. They're very minimal and simple. I just use icons like simple flat colors. So if I wanted to up my design game, I would probably need to get a designer and um, create something more thought out ahead of time instead of just like plugging it in code. But it works for me, and uh, that ties to pragmatism, which is the next section I want to talk about. All right, next, let's talk about pragmatism. So this is also a very heavy concept that was instilled in me uh, at my last company I worked at. And because it was kind of a smaller startup, so you the strength you have over other companies that have more money, and similarly for me now as a solo developer, I have to rely on being kind of frugal and pragmatic. And in general, what it means is that you want to do the minimal amount of work. <laughs> this is where it pays to be lazy, where you want to do the minimal amount of stuff required to solve a problem. And you'll always have this in the back of your mind. And it ties back to the design stuff I was talking about. So it's easy, it would have been, well, not easy, but it, it would have been an option for me to potentially try to hire or negotiate some kind of shared deal with a designer. But it wouldn't have been very pragmatic, I don't think, because first, I don't know how well this app is going to perform. It may flop completely, in which case I've, that would have been a wasted effort. So pragmatism has a lot to do with, um, especially at the beginning stages when you have an unproven product like my app here. Like I have no idea if people are going to find this valuable or not. So at the beginning, it's important for me to be as frugal and kind of minimal as possible. And that's the general philosophy I try to apply when building apps, especially in the first version. If for some reason, like one of my apps takes off and people start to like it a lot, then depending on how much it took off and the funds available, I can then invest more time later on. But for the first version, there's no need to go crazy. Try to be as minimal as possible to kind of prove out the concept. Which brings me to another kind of slogan you hear a lot in Silicon Valley and probably in other spaces and fields as well is done is better than perfect, which I like as well. Essentially what it means is that you don't want to over, you don't want to be a, too much of a perfectionist because there's no such thing as a perfect product. And usually what's valued is time to market and shipping something quickly, early and often as they call it. Um, the idea is that you want to create this kind of feedback cycle with your users because you don't know, you can't predict what your users will want or how they'll react to a product, whether they'll like it or not. You know, all you have is your own data. So the best way to validate something is to ship something very minimal, very quickly, uh, gain feedback from your users and then adjust accordingly. So then you get a much more proven um, reason, you, like a more scientifically <laughs> proven, I guess, via data reason to add a feature or not. Otherwise, it's just speculation. And this could be very crippling and paralyzing if you are if you haven't launched the product yet. It's easy to fall into the trap of overanalyzing and overthinking of like, oh, what if we need, oh, maybe we need this feature. Oh, crap, we probably really need this other feature. Oh, what if we do this? Oh, this button isn't perfect. We need to change this. And next thing you know, you're like 10 months in, in the dark and you haven't validated anything. So one 
obvious con of this is that, let's say, for example, hypothetical example, let's say you spent a month on something and you're technically ready to ship because the product is functional and does what it's supposed to do. But maybe you're thinking, maybe let's say it's like a Uber for pets or something, and it, or an app that delivers dog food or something. And then you get to the end and you've achieved your goal. Like the app does deliver dog food. And then somebody says, hey, but we probably need a social feed or like a picture sharing tool because maybe you want to take a picture of your dog. So like, is that picture taking thing really necessary to solving the core problem? Probably not at the beginning. So the, the con is if you're going for perfect instead of done, is you would spend, invest, let's say an extra month building a photo sharing tool. And then let's say you launch it and people don't care about the photo sharing, nobody uses it, but they still use the dog food. What that means in that case is that you've effectively wasted a month of work that nobody actually wanted versus if at that fork you decided, okay, let's not do the photo sharing, let's ship it first. And then later you realize that nobody actually wanted that thing, then there's no reason to build it. Obviously this comes in huge amounts of caveats and exceptions and every company is different, every project is different, every person is different. So this isn't like a blind rule, always do the minimal thing. Like sometimes you do, you have a very clear idea of what you want and regardless of what people say, you want it in there, which is totally fine. But in general, especially when you're strapped for resources like I am, you want to keep things as minimal as possible. This concept of MVP or minimal viable product what this essentially means is you want to, it, it all kind of ties the, together, minimalism, pragmatism, done is better than perfect, MVP, they're all generally the same philosophy, trying to push people to iterate quickly, ship small chunks more frequently rather than building monolithic like shrink wrap products. So MVP in a sense, same kind of deal where you want to figure out, given the problem you're trying to solve, what is the most minimal set of features that you would need to validate that or to solve that problem. And this is why it's important to always have a very clear problem um, in sight, because you can then use that as a barometer to test out or reflect on any feature that you're potentially contemplating. So if you know exactly and very clearly what you're trying to solve, then it makes it very clear what should and shouldn't be in the first release of the product. Yeah, that's the other thing you have to keep in mind when you're working on projects on your own and something I'm struggling with is being able to assess whether you're on the right track or whether you're working on the right things and kind of staying objective. Um, this, is not, this isn't something that's normally instilled in people when you're working in a company and definitely it's something I had to like figure out on my own because most of the time in a company and the larger the company, the more true this is where most of the direction and vision is coming from other people, or especially if you're a developer. And most of the time you're just executing on things that have been thought out by others. So you don't necessarily always have the reflex to be contrarian or to, to push back or to analyze and to self-reflect objectively of like, is this actually the right thing that I'm working on? In smaller companies, usually this is more kind of harvest, harvested, is that the right word? <laughs> more kind of instilled in people. And, um, yeah, so th this is something I fall in the trap of when I'm working on my own projects, because especially as programmers, we tend to love to just solve problems and kind of lock ourselves in a problem and just type away at it. But uh, when you're trying to build a project and manage your time, it's important to stay objective from time to time and kind of zoom out and think about like, am I working on the right thing? And I've fallen in the strap many, many times. So this app probably took longer than it should have had specifically because of that reason where I would get excited about a problem and I would just spend a whole day on it. And then next day I realized like, wait a minute, do I really need to solve that problem right now? Like, and a lot of times stuff I spent a lot of time on, I ended up cutting at the end. And this is why minimalism is hard too, because you have this kind of sunken cost fallacy where you spent so much time on something and because you spend so much time and you've invested so much, it makes it even harder to cut from the app. And this is why it's good to have multiple people that you can bounce ideas off of so that you can have somebody in a, in a non-invested state make the kind of hard decisions. So that's some of the hardest stuff I've had to do when developing. It's not necessarily the act of building the app, it's more the decision making that is the most stressful for me. There's a lot of times I come to places, I'm like, do I really need this? A lot of times I have to do like a band-aid move and just like rip it off and say F it, like I'm not, 
I'm not going to put this feature in. Like I'm, you need to remind yourself what your values are. Like if you value minimalism, then even if you've wasted three days on something and you have to just throw it all away, um, you sort of have to live with that. And it probably, I, I got a little more uh, immune to that at my last company where a lot of times we we would kind of shift depending on the like needs of the user and the direction of the company. So a lot of time, or we would just re-architect the code. So a lot of times we ended up just scrapping huge amounts of codes that we've written in the past. And it's always kind of a hard decision, but it also makes you feel a bit lighter at the end. So once you've gone through that a few times, you start to get a bit immune about, you start to get a little more detached from the code you've written and more attached to the product where you understand that by cutting the work, even though you took a long time, you're making the product better overall. All right, so finally, I'm gonna talk about some lessons I've learned while building this project specifically. So this app roughly took me about a month and I'm pretty, I worked pretty full time on it. Definitely worked more hours than I would have at a regular job. I was effectively from like morning to like 3 a.m. just working on this thing. And this is one, I guess, pseudo lesson I learned is that the amount of hours you spend doesn't necessarily mean they're all productive. And I talked about this briefly earlier, but this is a good lesson for me to reflect on is just being more aware of busy work and the trap of busy work. It's easy to conflate um, busy work with productive work uh, or valuable work really, where you could be spending time on solving a problem. It could be a difficult problem and it could be, your solution could be good and it may have some benefits in the future, but if ultimately it doesn't solve the problem or the, it doesn't help the purpose of the, the specific project you're working on, then it's a waste of time. So looking back, I, I'd say that maybe like 50, yeah, I would say even 50% of my time probably could have spent, been spent way better had I spent a little more time uh, thinking through what I really wanted to do rather than uh, conflating busy work with productive work because a lot of times you feel that if you're not programming actively that you're not being productive but looking back i would say that that's not necessarily true like sometimes spending a whole day without touching a computer and just thinking on paper probably would save you a lot more time down the road than you would think by wasting that day so all right second lesson learned is about testing and unit testing specifically the lesson learned i guess is i feel like i probably this is hard to say because at the beginning I spent a lot of times, like most of my time was spent writing tests. Like for any given function, I'd probably spend 10% on it and 90% writing the test, which at the end of the day is obviously good. The more test coverage you have, the more you're immune to like refactor refactoring bugs and obviously the more stable the app is. Um, but it did make me move much slower in the early stages. I would say that it's hard to estimate, but if I had to guess, maybe like 30 to 40% of the code I wrote overall is no longer in the app. Probably even more, I'd say 50%. There was a lot of stuff I, at the beginning where my vision wasn't super clear of the app. I would just try to build this like big theory library and try to come up with every combination. Like at the beginning I started building out algorithms for like given a set of chords, find a set of scales, given a set of scales, find a set of chords, given a set of notes, find a set of chords. I mean, every like permutation of notes, chords and scales and kind of interlinking between them. At the end, I only ended up keeping like three of those. But for each one, I had to spend time kind of figuring out the best algorithms, writing a ton of different tests and like all that time could have been saved had I known exactly what the app would have looked like. But obviously that's easy in hindsight. If I think about it now, I don't think I would have really, I feel like I had to go through the, those growing pains and through that exercise in order to finally get the aha moment of um, being able to see scales side by side and the notes they compare with it. That was kind of, that idea came almost like halfway through where I had that aha moment of, okay, this is the like ideal interface I want to have here. But prior to that, I was kind of more working on these, the like music theory library in a sense. Um, not to say that it's completely wasted work because if I wanted to build a separate app later that needed to use theory concepts, but in a different light, I could, that's the other advantage of using Git is that all that code is documented somewhere. I just have to kind of scroll back in history and, and pull it out. So it's not completely wasted. That's why I hesitate to call this like a full lesson learned, but it's something to be aware of um, and something to always keep in balance of how much testing, test coverage you want to have, 
early on when you don't have a fully fleshed out vision yet. Because even when my vision changed slightly and I had to ch adapt certain things, every time I made a change, I had to also change the specs if I ended up kind of drastically changing something. So it, it like as you have a larger library of tests, um, if you're significantly changing the interface of the functions you're testing, then you're always having to like refactor the test as well. So you're you're kind of incurring this little baggage that comes along with the ride. But at the end of the day, I think I'm happy because I don't think had I not written tests at the beginning and left that till the end and had to do like one giant sweep of tests, I think I would have been harder to do, at least like psychologically. It's much easier to like write something, test it, write something, test it, rather than just write all the tests for everything at the end, which could be a little overwhelming. Uh, the other lesson learned and kind of advice I would give myself is to test the app in real life. And what I mean real life is kind of step away from the computer. Again, this goes back to like the, the separation between the programmer and the kind of manager. If you're a one man team, you have to kind of play, wear both hats. Using the app in practice and disconnecting from the computer has this interesting mental shift. Like a lot of the feature ideas or bug fixes or bugs, sorry, that I found was me just playing with the app casually while waiting in line at a restaurant or out in public somewhere, just walking around basically away from like the developer mentality. A lot of times there, I think more like a user. So I tend to find more quirks and kind of real world stuff. So I would definitely encourage if you're, if you're building an app by yourself to do that more. And the other thing there is that you want to use the app in a practical sense for what its intended use is. So if you're building an Uber app, obviously you want to go out and test it in a car and see what it's like in the real world. So for me, for example, my primary use case for this is to have it on my piano stand and just while I'm playing piano, look at the reference of the scales. So that was a helpful thing for me to do is try to use it in practice. Like if I'm listening to Bach or something and I would just put the phone on my, on my piano, pick the scales that I could hear and then use that to try to analyze and see what was going on. And my final piece of kind of advice and lesson learned is to always think about future projects in terms of investment. So Every time you work on an app, the first app you build on your own is probably going to be the most expensive because you're having to reinvent the wheel for most things. You're going to have to build up that design system if that's what you want, uh, build up a system for managing table views, some kind of architecture for organizing your modules, organizing information and network requests if you need that, uh, storing and managing icons, fonts, and then towards the end, like app submission, generating screenshots, um, writing tests, uh, like you, there's a lot of kind of boilerplate stuff you need to go through. So the first app you build is probably going to be the most expensive, but always keep in mind your future self and always think of um, if I was to build another app in like a week, what could I do now to make that easier? Obviously, you don't want to go too far because you don't want to spend too much time over generalizing everything. But generally, try to keep things. I mean, this is a good programming practice in general, regardless of if you're going to reuse the code. But try to make things as isolated and encapsulated as possible so that you don't want the, the like reusable code to be tied to that specific app. You want to be able to kind of rip it out and use it elsewhere. And um, yeah, this is something that saved me a lot of time. I still need to do I probably need to make a private CocoaPod uh, repo and kind of build up my own formal toolkit that I can reuse. Right now, it's sort of a combination of me pulling code from previous apps. So it's not the most efficient thing, but it's a, a, at least I know that like I can grab files as is from other stuff without having ties to the other app and kind of easily reuse them in uh, future apps. It's a good philosophy to have in general, not just for app development, but for projects you're working on. Always think of ways, I think I heard this from Tim Ferriss, is always try to find ways to make whatever you're doing kind of a learning experience or like gather something from it that would be a useful asset to have in the future so that even if the project you're working on fails, you're always going to have um, something to take away from it. So for example, even if this app I built now flops completely, I'll still have a huge suite of like music theory code I've written. I've, I'll have knowledge of more knowledge of musical scales that I had before. Um, which I can use in my music as well. There's code I can reuse from here. There's learnings I did while submitting the app, like I built a separate toolkit to help me make screenshots. So there's always kind of pieces that you're, you, you can like invest so that you protect yourself in case something completely flops, which is very likely, or not very likely, but <laughs> let's face it, like a lot of things don't succeed. So always do things in, in a light of what can I do to make
um, myself grow better or make my future projects easier. Um, so yeah, that's something I'm trying to, basically this video, I'm like talking to myself in a way. Most of the advice I'm giving out is to myself, to my future self or my past self. Hopefully that was interesting. Let me know if you want to know more stuff like this. I don't want to contaminate or contaminate. I don't want to put too much like non-music specific content on this channel. But if there's enough people who are interested in it, I definitely would love to do more stuff like this. Just kind of talking about software development. And on that note, I'm working on another app that is more music based or like for recording and creating really weird loops. Uh, which I'm going to announce pretty soon. And if you guys are interested, I can do a similar video like this with that one uh, with separate sets of learning experiences. All right, so I'm going to wrap it up there. If you made it this far, thanks so much for watching. Let me know in the comments uh, how many of you are developers or if you find this interesting, if you want to see more stuff like this. I don't have a good gauge of what the overlap is between musicians and programmers. I know it's a very common like mix. I know I have a lot of friends who are programmers and musicians. There's, there's something in the brain that kind of wants to merge those two. Stay tuned for more cool stuff with synths and I'll see you guys in the next one.